Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, based on the time zone you're joining us today. My name is Victor Monga. I'm on the board of Cloud Security Alliance Los Angeles chapter. On the screen, you see a QR code that's going to take you to our LinkedIn, Twitter, or YouTube channel where you can find all the past recordings, and uh, this recording will be posted next week as well. All the slides have been posted to our LinkedIn channel, so if you are interested in getting a copy of uh, our today's slides, you can go to our LinkedIn channel. Let's go to the next slide, please. So today is our May 29th event. Um, we are uh, hosting this event with partner with uh, Trend Micro. We have, uh, we have been fortunate enough to partner with Trend Micro this year. They have uh, sponsored us and uh, helping us keep us uh, operational for the next event. So uh, today's speaker is Jason Dablo. Jason, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah, thank you, Victor. Uh, so my name is Jason Dablo uh, with uh, with Trend Micro. I think I have an introduction slide as well, so I don't want to spoil that um, by by talking too much now. But uh, great to be with uh, the membership here of CSALA, um, and happy to share some of the knowledge that I have today. Awesome. And uh, most of you know me, but my name is Victor Monga, and uh, we have our LinkedIn profiles here, just in case if you guys would like to um, connect with us. So feel free to do so. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Jason. Jason, all yours. Yeah, thanks again, uh, Victor. So kind of starting on a, a bit of a light note here, um, for those of you um, that uh, kind of participate in some of the, uh, the swiping right activities, um, that's, a, that's a good thing. So what we're trying to accomplish here is, is really getting the approval, uh, particularly with security, um, you know, and, and talking more and more about uh, really how to integrate that quicker, sooner, um, as well as more efficiently within, uh, you know, software build pipelines. Uh, so last time I kind of talked about kind of VMs versus containers. I'm going to follow up uh, with just some history in terms of recapping, just a, a, taking a few minutes about uh, what I talked about last time, and then continuing on with more discussions into um, particularly containers. Um, and then really, how do we start kind of thinking about um, security, DevSecOps, and in introducing security into these containerized workflows? I do have uh, some demos as well as some things to share that you can take home and use within your own, your own environment as well, um, should you want to. Um, I do have a few QR codes as part of this session. Um, this one's just my LinkedIn profile, so if you want to um, add me a bit easier, if QR codes are your thing, makes it a bit easier to um, to kind of do that. So um, there is a few um, with giving away kind of different software and things like that. So um, have those cameras ready if if you if you like scanning QR codes as well. Um, so uh, ultimately, what I do is I get to uh, travel around as part of Trend Micro. I guess I'm not doing a whole bunch of travel now, but I'm really focusing on talking with different customers in terms of what they're currently doing in terms of either their DevOps practices and how to how they're introducing security into those, or how they're doing it, particularly um, you know in cloud migrations. And um, I have a number of talk tracks around you know doing um, cloud security and cloud migration talks as well. Um, but certainly here we're really focusing on again kind of this container security as we kind of move through. Um, you know, and, and swiping right, making sure that uh, we're shifting our visibility more to the left. Um, and again, I'll go into more detail with that as well. Uh, so this continues on this kind of DevOps talk track in terms of introducing security into this as well. So what I talked about, um, you know, I think it's been a couple months now. Um, so we kind of went over just a definition of DevOps. I'm sure you've heard this several times being um, in cloud security professionals like most of you are. Um, you know, it is this idea about continually testing, doing continuous integration, um, making sure that there's tons of collaboration between the teams that are doing this. Um, some teams might be growing in size in terms of taking over operations or building infrastructure. That would be traditionally an IT uh, engineering job, but um, that more on that is kind of shifting into the development hand as well, so they can actually provision the correct um, 
uh, provision the correct resources that they might need by utilizing things like infrastructure as code. Um, I won't be talking too much about infrastructure as code, but I do have a, a fun talk track on that too that I'll be sharing with you guys in the next coming webinars as well. Um, so as kind of just a recap, um, we talked a little bit about this too in terms of the earlier that you can find problems within a development cycle, you really get the, uh, the enhancement and the ability to actually do it cheaper uh, as well as more efficiently. So you're ultimately delivering value to your customers a lot quicker by introducing security earlier on within this build process. So I touched on this last time and um, the last of kind of the, the touch points here in terms of kind of as a recap from last time is really kind of the differences here in terms of VMs versus containers. Um, so in, tr in a traditional environment, we might have been uh, building things like uh, virtual machines um, using different processes, uh, software development processes. You still might have a CI CD tool set building into virtual machines. But then as we kind of start doing this more uh, enhanced application development, um, really focusing on containers, microservices and um, really splitting apart an application into smaller pieces, you really start to accelerate the deployment of these containerized environments and the applications going into them, which really allows you, again, your, you and your teams to actually speed up the value that you're delivering by kind of not making, uh, have a, an entire VM with all of the, you know, operating system, all of the resources in use for that, but really just uh, providing a virtualization layer for the applications themselves that allow you to kind of decouple those applications and break them into smaller pieces as well. And again, ultimately accelerating the value that we're delivering to our customers. So what are these uh, microservices? Uh, what does that mean in terms of, um, you know, what is a microservice? So we talked a little bit of, uh, last time about building a container using a Docker file and what that looks like in terms of the layers. But the actual containers themselves are generally called microservices in that they're just a small piece of, um, uh, of an overall application that works independently uh, of themselves. So they're independently deployed, updated, uh, and then as part of this microservice design, they would just kind of communicate via APIs, whether that's RESTful or via HTTP uh, or something similar, and basically um, coordinate the work that they're doing um, in a loosely coupled fashion with the other microservices as part of an overall larger application. So if you wanted to say increase the resource utilization of say just one piece of your application, you could just spin up a, like a second container that would be um, doing that same job. And then again, helping uh, load balance the request through the other API connected uh, microservices to essentially give you the ability to again, uh, it, it allows you to decouple everything so you can really making sure everything's tested. You can make sure that everything is maintained based on its own specifications in, again, a, a more smaller lightweight fashion, as opposed to having to manage this overall large kind of monolithic application that you would see here on the left with that uh, forklift. So by breaking this up, you also kind of remove, uh, you know, a number of the the problems that we see with monolithic applications and um, maybe a change that happens somewhere might break the rest of the application. Um, so just kind of furthering that discussion around containers and those applications that are being deployed within them. Uh, so this is a software architecture design pattern, which again allows us and each service to run independently. Um, so again, this is where they communicate via APIs, uh, RESTful or HTTP. HTTP. Um, so that's just one of the mechanisms that they might use for communication. Uh, each one of these is inherently small. Um, you know, you saw on the last slide, highly maintainable, um, easy to say, spin up new resources or bring up additional um, uh, additional things as needed in terms of you know, updating a particular component and making sure that that, that component is uh, completely tested, deployed, um, as well as independently scalable apart from the rest of the application itself. So ultimately you get this kind of, uh, by breaking up this monolithic app architecture, you're actually speeding up the agility and the performance uh, within that particular application design. 
So as you start deploying these containers in production, and again, containers are just running each of these different microservices, uh, there comes a question on how do we, how do we manage these? Um, so if you were familiar with, say, Docker, you could say Docker run and deploy a container using that software. But what if I need, what if I'm noticing that one of my microservices that's running in a container um, is actually falling behind and, and generating a larger queue for the work that's supposed to be done? Generally, you would have to say, again, go into Docker and say Docker run and run a second uh, image for that particular microservice and uh, automatically set up the networking. So you can then uh, create this low balance or highly available microservice that's now running multiple containers as well. So certainly you can do that, but then it starts becoming super kind of, you have a lot of overhead and you now have a person that's actively going through and doing this monitoring you know, the performance, uh, how the application is behaving, what it's doing, and really making sure that they're consistently tweaking that to really get the best performance out of it as well. So this is really where the concept of container orchestration came in. Um, so something like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm. Uh, these are uh, extremely popular container orchestration tools uh, that are out there. And they simply go by, um, doing all of that legwork for you in terms of deploying uh, one of your microservices into a container, making sure that the performance and the networking is all set up as it should be, and doing so in a automated fashion. So if you think of it much like vCenter, um, it kind of has a lot of similarities there where you could say install ESX and log into uh, you know, VMware ESX, do uh, basically spin up a, a new VM, um, and you can do that directly from that ESX console. But if you wanted to do that across, say, multiple ESX hosts, um, treat them all as a kind of um, uh, a unified platform of deploying, as well as saving, say, images and deploying them to multiple servers, that's really where vCenter comes in. So if you think of uh, Kubernetes and Swarm the same way, uh, it's, again, that same tooling. It gives you the, the, uh, the breadth of doing your deployments across uh, multiple facets as well as giving you additional tool sets like, um, you know, like monitoring tools, operational tools, things like that as well. There are some key differences between Kubernetes and Swarm. Um, so one of the main ones is because uh, Swarm is part of the Docker Enterprise package, it only works with Docker containers. They're only using the Docker APIs. Where if you think of Kubernetes, which um, is pretty much the de facto standard when it comes to container orchestration, uh, think of it a lot like Legos. Um, so you can actually build the framework of however your container orchestration wants to run. You can use uh, the different container hypervisors. So whether it's Docker um, or uh, Run C or Container D, what, whichever, uh, whichever uh, containerized platform you choose, you can actually build that into Kubernetes as well. So it actually gives you in infinitely more flexibility, but with that flexibility also comes infinitely more, I would say, complexity as well. Because, because you have each kind of little Lego piece, uh, maybe you're not building your Legos correctly, or maybe you're leaving them on the floor for somebody to step on and, and you know, scream out in pain as well. So th the idea of giving you ultimate power on how your containers are actually deployed and build within um, an operational environment, can be seen as both a positive and a negative. But for one, it is, uh, there's more eyes on Kubernetes and deploying it and developing and deploying for it than any other um, kind of orchestration tool that's out there. Again, due to the uh, flexibility that it allows. If you wanna create your own network engine that does proxying between containers, you can do that with Kubernetes. Um, and you can set up your logging, your operational stats, whatever you would like in terms of writing uh, specific applications for Kubernetes as well. So here's just kind of a, a real basic diagram on what Kubernetes looks like uh, from a, uh, a zoomed out point of view. So you'll always have this Kubernetes master. Uh, the master is what kind of controls the cluster. And when you think of cluster, think of it the same way as clustered machines. There's just a, a collection of servers or hosts that are running all of your containers, in this case, um, a collection of nodes, so Kubernetes nodes, 
uh, is all within a cluster that then the master is then running. So each one of, say, your server nodes uh, or your worker nodes, um, think of it like a, you know, a, a machine that's out there running it. So a Kubernetes node is a host, and then inside that node you have all of the processes as well as all of the containers that each one of those as well. So the master coordinates all of the different nodes that are in use, as well as the nodes are the actual workers that run your containerized applications. Uh, so here's kind of a traditional architecture that you might see when you start deploying production uh, containers into a Kubernetes cluster. So on the left-hand side, you'd see a number of developers. They would push their new code into a code repository. The code repository would then be store, storing the images in an image repository or container image registry. What this does is it basically catalogs and inventories all of the, all of the containers that you have available to launch. Uh, so think of it just like a locker room. And each one of those lockers is a container image that then can be opened and, and deployed out into a runtime environment. So each of these can then be um, deployed out into production and you might have say uh, Kubernetes can actually, uh, a cluster can be across uh, multi-platforms as well. So some of them could be running Docker, some of them could be running say Containerd, some could be in an on-premise environment on a physical machine, some might be out um, in a cloud environment in a ho hosted Kubernetes uh, fashion like EKS or AKS in, um, AWS and Azure, uh, uh, whatever that word is that means uh, um, that they all line up with. So AWS EKS and Azure AKS. Um, so ultimately what happens is you have the Kubernetes then managing your clusters, the performance and being able to scale the containers that you would like within your environment. For those of you that, um, want to play with this. Um, so in AWS Marketplace, again, here's the second of the QR codes that basically just brings you to this, um, this same thing. Uh, a company called Bitnami basically publishes this Kubernetes sandbox, uh, which gives you kind of the most up-to-date Kubernetes platform with all the security best practices already configured. And it allows you to really play around within a Kubernetes environment and you're only responsible for the EC2 instance charges. There's not a subscription for running these particular, um, for this particular uh, image. Um, and it really gives you kind of a baseline where you can just take it and learn. And I know there's a number of kind of web applications as well that let you play with say Docker containers specifically for say 30 minutes at a time. But this is a, a, a nice easy way. Uh, you know, a T3 medium is about four cents an hour. Um, so if you want to just spin this up for an hour and then shut it down. Um, you know, you're talking about a nickel. Uh, so it really allows you to kind of play with a Kubernetes platform, um, deploy some sample applications if you would like in really a, a low cost manner. Um, and I'll actually be using this in a follow-up webinar in terms of deploying some other software, some containers. Um, and so keep, a, keep an eye out for that uh, in the next coming months. And, and again, we'll, we'll dive into this architecture a bit more during that time. So here, as we're kind of deploying into these types of environments, so deploying your containerized workload, this is really where the term DevSecOps comes in. And as I mentioned in the beginning, it's all about the collaboration, right? So while some might say that, um, you know, DevSecOps is DevOps teams introducing security into their runtimes, which uh, is, is partially true, you also have the uh, collaboration of specific teams that are still decoupled as well. So not everybody is going to have a DevSecOps teams where the developers are also responsible for securing their own applications, but more so about collaborating with InfoSec uh, or collaborating with IT teams and making sure that they can accomplish these things in a, um, I would say, a more agile manner or a more accelerated manner which really, again, helps accelerate the value that we're delivering to our customers through these DevOps processes as well. 
So by saying like, you know, instead of security walking over to the development teams with either a 20 page PDF or printed out security policies that says, hey, you guys need to implement this if you're going to take over the operational side of things. Uh, more so that, um, you know, that strategy is not going to be successful because it's just one team throwing the, throwing the work over the wall to the other instead of collaborating and working together on solving this in terms of, um, again, accelerating that value. So a more likely, uh, a more likely process that will be successful is um, you know, the developers have the knowledge of, of writing this code, like security as code, as you see here. Uh, they all might have some knowledge like infrastructure as code, but um, while they do have the code writing knowledge, it's going to be um, important for the, infra in, the InfoSec teams to really deliver that security knowledge and again, collaborating and making sure that the security is implemented at an earlier time because again, we know through a number of different reports that this not only saves money, um, but also saves time within your development cycle as well. So when you start talking about um, combining de devs with security, um, it's all about the quality of the code. That is the only problem that's seen here and making sure that the quality that we're producing, that our developers are producing with their applications are actually being uh, considered in terms of the security lens. So not just making sure that, you know, we're, we're leaving uh, or we're closing all of our uh, parentheses and adding all the, col all the um, commas where it needs to be and making sure that our application is very performant, but also making sure that the, um, you know, the the libraries that we're using from uh, different platforms are all up to date and not introducing vulnerabilities into this as well. What we've seen in terms of vulnerabilities, um, so uh, for those of you that aren't aware, the OWASP top 10 has been collecting um, essentially uh, the, sec the security threats or problems that have affected uh, web applications. Um, they've been doing this for quite some time. Um, what we tend to see is that over the years, they've actually not changed that much. Um, so, you know, in 2010, we had, you know, injection and cross-site scripting as number one and two. Uh, as we move into 2013, we have injection, cross-site scripting's dropped down. We have a couple new ones um, that have showed up due to, um, I would say, a more connected web world where more and more stuff is uh, being put in a cloud environment and open for everybody to see. You see a number of, you know, access control as well as, um, you know, sensitive data that's now um, being used by different applications, um, kind of popping up new on this list as well. And then finally in 2017, um, you know, we're seeing the exact same thing, still injection, still broken off session management, still cross-site scripting largely unchanged in terms of the top 10, you know, seven of the top 10 that ha hasn't changed over, you know, the course of, of uh, over 10 years. You're starting to see uh, more and more things around access control and things like that. Uh, as again, more and more things come on, come online to uh, public accessibility. But the idea that, you know, the, the OWASP top 10, the threats is wildly different year over year in terms of different attack strategy is um, completely unproven we're seeing that largely it's exactly the same. So by treating these, you know, we're, we're confident that at least seven of these haven't changed over the course of the OWASP top 10, focusing on those as part of the quality first in terms of security and development, that really helps us kind of get the majority of the way there. Um, obviously by focusing on, you know, things like injection or cross-site scripting, you're actually inherently making your um, application more secure, as well as improving the performance of it as well. So how do we do, how do we start um, thinking about this OWASP top 10, and what do we do to implement security into Dev, and particularly in a testing framework? So after your application is kind of given the thumbs up in terms of the source code, uh, it's compiled. We now want to do some tests. Uh, maybe this is uh, we want to scan for vulnerabilities within the packages in use. Or maybe we wanna make sure that the configuration management is done for 
how it's actually being deployed within an environment. It's also technologies here like unit testing, which making sure that the functionality is there and the code is actually able to run, or map and track dependencies, which allows um, really developers to see that you know, they might uh, have an, uh, a piece of software that maybe has 20 lines of code that calls maybe three packages. But the dependencies for those three packages might include, say, 20 or 30 other additional dependencies as well. And those uh, dependencies that are brought in might have additional dependencies for them as well. So we have um, actually one of our partners, Sneak. Um, they're really development focused in terms of open source and finding these things. What they've seen is that um, you know a sample kind of Java application that pulls in three packages. Um, so it might look like you just have three versions of dependencies to check, but each one of those actually brings up over a thousand different dependencies. So using, say, technology like uh, Sneak, you can actually start mapping and tracking these dependencies within an environment to making sure that, again, the embedded vulnerabilities or so the connected vulnerabilities are actually patched within this environment as well. Um, so within the release staging here, as kind of we pass the kind of the, the first automation tests, we now want to start looking at, say, uh, how do we actually fix vulnerabilities if there is no software patch available? Or how can we start looking at the mo monitoring of performance? Or um, how can we quickly identify these different threats as well? So this is really where you start com combining the operations and security piece um, and really looking at specific strategies as part of this um, deployment cycle. So here, as we release or as we go into staging, these would certainly be uh, things that you would want to look at as well as automate within your environment as well. So to kind of wrap this all together and, and uh, then I'm going to switch over to a demo for the last kind of 10-15 um, minutes um, is really kind of bringing this all together in terms of an architecture and what that might look like for a development to start uh, introducing security in a, a DevSecOps manner. This is kind of similar to the, the Kubernetes, um, you know, production architecture that I shared previously. You know, you still have pushing the code version. You still have pulling in uh, new code with your CI/CD tool that's represented by the butler. That's uh, the the icon for Jenkins. Um, so Jenkins basically packages all of your um, all of the, all of the different source code to uh, essentially put it all together in an application that then handles the delivery of it as well. So as part of that uh, process, that CI CD process, continuous integration, continuous delivery or continuous deployment, you can start integrating different uh, pieces directly for automating these security tests. So we talked about the unit testing and making sure that, um, you know, we're leaving all those parentheses closed and we didn't forget any commas. Uh, we might do some static analysis uh, of the functionality of the application, again, just check if there's, say, any known vulnerabilities that we can see right off the bat. We might also do some dynamic testing here, which actually you know, uh, deploys it uh, in a sense in terms of in a staging environment and then uh, really looks at how the different parts communicate with each other by um, pushing out, say, some sample uh, forms of a web application and testing the different forms and functions to making sure that they're not accepting any illegal characters or things like that. And then you might also incorporate uh, dependency scanning, which is you know, um, you know, a tool like Sneak that allows you, again, to watch not just your direct dependencies, but also the indirect dependencies that those might have within a particular environment. Uh, here's it, it's also important to start uh, uh, looking into, say, a registry service um, to essentially start making sure that those container images are free from vulnerabilities after it's already been built. So now that the complete container has been built, maybe we want to look to making sure, um, you know, a developer just didn't pull some bad code off of uh, Docker Hub. Or um, maybe they left in some coin mining software or some other things that might, uh, like a, a private key. Uh, or, or some other type of, um, you know, identifiable information that should be caught and before it reaches a production or runtime state. 
You can also hook that directly into the build pipeline as well. So if you want to scan it before it reaches the registry, you should do that as well. Um, this is the piece I'm going to be talking about um, in terms of the demo. So um, keep that in mind as, as you kind of progress through this as well. We'll also want to make sure that we have runtime protection for all of our different container environments, um, hooking in with, say, the Docker engine. You might also do some inspection of the containers themselves using technology like a RAS for privileged container security, which again, um, I'll have some discussions on that uh, coming later this year and other follow-up webinars as well. So these kind of all technologies really kind of work together in making sure that on the right, your InfoSec team has the information they need by particularly gathering data from a SIM, but also um, using communication tool sets such as Slack to um, really notify developers on how they usually um, you know, squash bugs, um, either through bug tracking like PagerDuty or ServiceNow, or direct notification via Slack channel that alerts them that, hey, their application might be under attack and they need to fix something within that as well. Um, so here's kind of the last architecture that I have before I'm just gonna dive into a quick demo um, also. But what you see here is kind of, a, um, again, a more simplified terms in terms of uh, our simplified architecture as we're deploying containers. And again, we wanna make sure that we're implementing different security checks and security controls like a container security uh, uh, solution. So while there is say free solutions out there or solutions that um, I would say um, aren't that expensive. So right off the top of my head, the AWS ECR container scanner, quick and easy way to implement uh, container scanning within say a, um, an AWS ECR, which is their uh, container registry. Um, but it only does open source vulnerability. So it's only looking at, or I should say, it's only using an open source vulnerability scanner, um, it's often called Claire. Uh, so Claire is the one of the ones that's most widely used and it falls under that vulnerability scanning. As you start moving into say more co commercial applications, you also start um, being able to integrate more and more technology that helps you find different things like malware, like different content or compliance checks, like doing it against the CIS benchmarks as well as different integrations that you might need for other registry services. So uh, maybe you're, you have some on-premise services, certainly the AWS ECR would not be a good fit there. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna show you a little bit uh, about this um, technology. Um, so first and foremost, make it really easy to deploy into something like AWS. And I, I can share the CloudFormation that builds all this out. Um, again, this is, uh, I would, I'll caution you a bit more expensive than the Bitnami um, uh, image that I shared earlier. That's just a few cents an hour um, because this is using managed Kubernetes. So it's using EKS, it's using load balancers as well as four hosts. There is um, you know, a larger upfront cost in terms of running this within your environment. Just, I just want to point that out there so people aren't, um, they do decide to try out this service that they're not surprised with uh, the consumption that it's using. But what it does is it builds out uh, three worker nodes for all of the different containers um, that are actually doing the container scanning. Um, so that's kind of the nice part about this tool is it, um, it is a cloud native design as well. So you have the essentially the ability to move that back over. Um, you're deploying it within a Kubernetes cluster itself. Uh, each of the containers can be increased to increase the performance of the scanning. Uh, and you're also building to best practices with all of the worker nodes protected behind a um, private subnet um, with just a, batch, a bastion host that's allowed to log in and view that. So this really kind of uh, really super easy to build out within your environment. Again, it's a CloudFormation template. It asks you about five questions where you want to build it, um, asks you for the um, your key pair and then you're all set. And you essentially have then technology which you can then use to start scanning your build pipeline. So this is what it looks like in terms of um, the a container uh, security tool, this one being from Trend Micro. So this is Trend Micro's smart check solution for 
pre-runtime container security. Um, you can see that first and foremost at the bottom here, we're listing out the registries that we're attached to. So in this instance, we have a registry with uh, a number of images within it that allows us to really introduce that continuous scanning concept. So as images change within our environment or new images are deployed into the registry, so again, this is pre-runtime, prior to them launching into the Kubernetes cluster, we can actually give visibility into things like uh, malware or pieces of content or again, vulnerabilities that might be seen within this as well. So you can actually add uh, you know, multiple uh, registries within this. So you can extend this from say into Google, into ECR, on-premise, whatever that looks like within your environment and then again, be scanning it as well. Um, I do have a question in the chat uh, if we install Helm. Um, yes, because we do use Helm to install as part of, uh, to get us into a Kubernetes cluster. Um, Helm, for those of you that don't know, is um, simply a technology that allows you to install a framework into a Kubernetes environment. So we do have a Helm chart for deep security smart check, which then Kubernetes can use to essentially deploy that into the proper containers using the proper networking um, and really um, setting up uh, all of the different networking load balancing things that you need within the environment. So I appreciate that question. Um, that, that, that's great information there as well. So as we start looking at the different scans that have happened within the environment, we can start to see kind of additional information about what um, kind of the different images and how they look. Since we are actually going um, file by file and layer by layer, um, so on my first webinar, I talked about a Docker file and um, introducing um, new software or new, uh, each line is basically counted as a layer. So you can see here that we're, um, you know, the term peeling back the onion, you have um, each one of the individual layers of a container. We actually get visibility to, into, into the rule so we can see if, say, a vulnerability was introduced by bringing in a older, uh, an older software package. Uh, so we might say for this that um, when we ran this command as setting up our actual container within the Docker file, we can see that the layer ID was this giant SHA-256 SHA value. But then we can also see the vulnerabilities that were introduced uh, within this particular package. So this command here, um, it installed the uh, SQLite 3, as well as the version that we have here. Um, it's a part of a Debian package. And then what we're seeing is actual these um, different CVEs that are associated with this particular package as well. So what I can then do is say, okay, well, give me more information about this. And now we're taken directly to the uh, Debian site that lists out the vulnerability as well as how to fix that. We can then uh, basically inform our developers through that Jenkins, the CICD tool set that actually helped build this image and add the information of the CVEs back into the project. So as a developer is building their application, they'll actually create a software project within Jenkins. Um, and then they'll say, okay, compile my code and push it and build it. And then they'll get a feedback, again, in my example with Slack, Slack would then tell them that, hey, uh, Jenkins has a, a problem. It saw that there was vulnerabilities within this. And then it would also give you, you need to update uh, your, the SQLite version that you called and making sure that uh, you update it to three button. 27.2-2 to essentially solve that vulnerability. So you, ana you now get not just the visibility into the vulnerabilities, again, this is all pre-runtime, but you can actually let the, the developer know that, hey, a vulnerability was built into it, and you can also let your runtime security know that, hey, we launched this, oops, accidentally with these CVEs, Maybe we should start protecting this with, say, a virtual patching solution like Trend Micro's Deep Security. So you kind of get that both point of view from a, a visibility in terms of how to fix it from a development side, but as you're fixing it, we have that compensating control for you as well. Let's take a look at some of this uh, content finding. So in this one, in this particular layer, we copied in a directory and uh, we just see it that it's uh, hashed out in Base64. So, but what we see is that 
um, actually, as we were scanning the file system, we actually found the private keys that was stashed away um, that a developer might be used in, um, say, an organization to actually test out the authentication by just generating some temporary keys, but they forgot to actually remove them before launching the application. So now we get a content finding that this was left in there, so we can make those changes prior to it launching as well. I know I'm running just a sh bit short on time, but I also wanted to show one last thing in terms of a piece of malware, because that's important uh, too to, to find within it. Um, as part of that, we can also detect uh, pieces of malware that might exist. So you can see here with the, um, you know, the, the virus icon here that when we try to copy a file in, we see the, the vulnerability. We also have other findings with this particular image in WordPress. And when we tried to add, say, the ICAR, we can also show you the um, where that is as well. So ICAR is really just a, a test file in terms of testing um, anti-malware solutions. So it's not a real threat within this environment, but certainly as part of that malware finding, we'd want to make sure that those are eliminated from it as well. We also link and show you directly our virus encyclopedia, which might give you additional information on cleaning this up as well. And then again, delivering this um, all within an API model. Since this is a Kubernetes application, everything communicates via an API. We could also deliver all of the results via um, things like a webhook. So you can actually um, say, have a Slack listener for these webhooks, deliver the fix, deliver the cleanup, as well as the visibility into the corresponding teams, whether the security team needs to know about a runtime uh, vulnerability so they can begin protecting against it, or um, uh, notifying a developer that this exists within their um, uh, within the package that they're just trying to, to, to deploy so they can es essentially fix it within um, their environment as well. Um, so this is the container security piece that Deep Security Smart Check that I shared is a part of an overall Cloud One solution that's really focused on helping builders uh, with what they're building in a cloud environment. Again, I'll talk about some of these other solutions in the upcoming webinars, as well as kind of following along with some of the, the teaching, the principles on why it's important to say, introduce say a RAS technology or making sure developers as they're writing infrastructure as code is getting real time checks within it as well. So um, there's technologies and, and some things that we can share there in terms of free tooling that really allows developers to build better in the future as well. Uh, so this is a QR code for the uh, CloudFormation template that I share that builds out uh, the smart check solution within a EKS environment. Uh, it does prompt you for a license code. You don't need a, a license code. It, it can deploy without it. Um, so it'll automatically give you a, a trial of that if you'd like to try the technology within your environment um, and certainly reach out if you have others um, uh, others as well. Um, another question about Istio, um, I'd love to, to throw that in as, as well in, in some of my follow-up webinars. Um, certainly a, a great technology in terms of helping uh, people build in different cloud environments, particularly in, in containers and Kubernetes as well. So I will certainly uh, kind of talk about that as well. So I appreciate those questions too. Um, and I think finally, uh, Victor, um, you know, I see some kind of questions kind of coming in, but ultimately I'd like to give you just, uh, I know we're maybe a minute over, but uh, talk about maybe some next events and, and some follow-ups here as well. Um, also just one last uh, thing I do post regularly on LinkedIn in terms of sharing, not just trend micro stuff, but also just kind of unbiased security um, knowledge. I think we're all in this to kind of learn together. Um, I'm certainly don't know everything about, um, you know, all of the stuff that I talked about, I'm still learning myself. Um, but ultimately as we communicate with each other and kind of um, help build each other's um, knowledge within the CSA community, it'll essentially help us all do better within our own organizations and really help uh, maintain that, that security should be first and foremost and a focus for not just developers, but overall organizations and, and the culture of that organization as well. Thank you, Jason. That was really good. Thanks so much. So for those, uh, uh, Jason mentioned a couple of times that uh, there was first talk. So I put that in the chat window. Also, you can scan the QR code on your screen. That'll take you to our LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. All of those videos and previous sessions are there. 
So feel free to check it out, give us your feedback. We are continuing working with Jason to have upcoming sessions as well. So you'll hear more about those topics Jason mentioned in this, this webinar. So with that, um, I would like to thank you, Jason, and all, att all attendees that uh, who joined today. Uh, once again, thanks so much, Jason. No, thank you for having me again. Um, it's been a pleasure talking with uh, you know, your membership here at CSALA, and hope I can um, you know, help with some more knowledge transfer in, in, in the near future as well. So thank you, Victor, for the opportunity.